Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Very well, how are you? Good, glad to, really glad to be doing this. <laughs> we are also very excited. <laughs> Hi, David, good morning to you. Good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, where, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm very much in India, yeah, it's a good evening for me. <laughs> Hi, Rakesh. Hi, hi, Aditya. Hi, Shweta and David. Good, I think a lot of participants are joining. A lot of yes. people are excited to listen to David today. <laughs> yeah, I hope I can, I hope I can deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting a lot of queries. People want to listen to you. So we're really thankful to you for sparing time for us. Oh, my pleasure. Really, my pleasure. It's an honor, privilege. Glad to be doing it. Is there anything that we should talk about before, before we begin? Is there any, um, anything logistic or otherwise that we should settle? Or, I mean, I, nothing I'm worrying about, but just in case there's something you guys need to talk about now. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a relaxed conversation. So we just want to, we don't want to make it very formal. It's a, it's a relaxed conversation coming like from a friend. So <laughs> how much time? One minute to go. One. Please One be ready. Start. Welcome to everyone. This is me, Shweta Karenai from the Jane Goodall Institute, India. I will be your host for today's voice. With me, I have Adit, Director, Climate India. Adit, can you please say hi to everybody? Uh, hi, hi, David. Hi, Rakesh. Hi, Shweta. And hi to everybody who's there in the audience. Thank you so much for sparing a Saturday evening to be with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aditya. Voices of Hope is about stories brought to you by Jain Goodall Institute India, which also has a story. It began I moved to Tanzania, met and started working with Jain Goodall Institute Tanzania Roots and Shoots in Dar es Salaam. Recently, I moved back to India with a mandate of the Jain Good Institute in India to give you an understanding of our work, what we do. We would like you to watch this very short video. In 1960, a young British woman ventured into the forests of Africa to follow her childhood dream, to find a way to watch free wild animals living their own undisturbed lives. She left everything familiar behind and ended up giving the world a remarkable window into our closest living relatives. She was me. I wanted to come as close to understanding animals as I possibly could. 
are continuing our research at Gombe. It's the longest running study of any non-human animal. And we're using some exciting new technology to learn more about chimpanzee ranging patterns and the state of the forest. And this helps to inform decision makers on action to be taken to protect chimpanzees, their habitats, and the other creatures that live there. I flew in a small plane over Gombe National Park and I was absolutely horrified at what I saw. So quickly it seemed, the environment outside the National Park had been utterly destroyed. The trees had gone. The land was over-farmed and infertile. They were struggling to survive. And that's when I realized that unless we helped the people to improve their lives, there was no way we could even try to save the precious chimpanzees. This was when we started Take Care or Tukari, our community-centered conservation project. Everywhere I went, I met young people who seemed to have lost hope. They all said more or less the same thing. We feel like this because we think you've compromised our future. And so that led into our program for youth, Roots and Shoots. The main message of Roots and Shoots is that every one of us makes a difference every single day. The program has now become a movement that's in 100 countries around the world. One of the things that the Jane Goodall Institute does that I feel is really most important is to try and give people hope, to help people understand that every single day we live, we can make a difference. And together, with everybody making a difference, we can change the world. One of the very important work which JJI does is about trying giving people hope and inspire them to take action. Currently, humanity is facing challenges. We're still in pandemic. We are faced with the ecological breakdown, and biggest of all, the climate crisis. In this situation, we tend to because of despair, sadness, fear. If we lose hope, we don't take action. Thus, it becomes really important to hear stories of people who take action. and understand why listening to such are so important. Very often people say to me, but if this little insect disappears, surely it doesn't make any difference. Everything is interconnected and that little insect might be the major food source of some other creature who then might disappear as well. And so it goes on with this interrelationship, the web of life, all the strands, uh, forming a beautiful pattern and that pattern is being destroyed. How is it possible that the most intellectual creature that's ever walked on planet Earth is destroying its only home? We're destroying Mother Earth so fast. I truly feel that we can only achieve our true human potential, which is huge, if we have harmony between head and heart. It's not a bit surprising to me that as I was traveling around the world, I met many young people who seemed not to have much hope for the future. Each and every one of us makes a difference each and every day. And we have a choice. What kind of difference are we going to make? So this for me is why conservation is so important. And it's why this program I began for young people, Roots and Shoots, getting young people to understand the importance of protecting nature because we're part of the natural world. Hello, this is Jane Goodall. I've so often said that if you want to change the way people think, you must reach their hearts because true change must come from within. And the best way to reach the heart 
is by telling stories. That's why the Jane Goodall Institute, India, JGI India, is launching Voices of Hope so as to share the stories of different people. And we hope that these stories will reach your heart and inspire you to do all that you can to protect and nurture Mother Nature and the animals who live with us on the planet. We especially hope that these stories will inspire young people to take action. Voices of Hope brings you the stories from three key areas of roots and shoots, people and environment. The main roots and shoots is each one of us makes a difference every single day. And we have to decide what kind of difference we have to make. To have to an environmentalist, scientist, journalist, you can be just you, who you are. You take action because your action can. Today we have one who is not a scientist, definitely not an activist. This is why in a way which helped shape the new narrative climate storytelling. It was 2017. David Wallace Wells, in a class, wrote an essay depicting how the future will look to living if we make drastic changes in life. As this art, the inhabitable hearth became the most read history of the magazine. The very important conversation. David continue conversation in his book, The Uninhabitable Heart. Please welcome David to inspire you to action, to take action through him today. Hi, thank you everybody. Um, thank you, Shweta. And um, it's great to be here and speaking with um, all of you. Um, I'm especially honored to be um, participating in an outreach program of the Jane Goodall Institute as I'm an enormous admirer of hers. Um, I thought I'd just begin though by, by talking a little bit about how I came to this subject and where it led me. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't start with, with hope. It may end in hope, but it doesn't start in hope. <laughs> but I think it's useful to, to really be honest about the state of the obstacles that we're facing so that we can, among other things, find ourselves encouraged by the progress that is being made and understand just how important even um, small, uh, you know, small progress is while keeping in mind the scale of the challenge that's ahead of us. So, you know, unlike Jane, um, I'm not somebody who felt compelled to go and live with chim chimpanzees in the jungle. Um, that is not my background. That's not who I am. I'm I don't even really to this day think of myself as an environmentalist. Um, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Um, I, you know, I've never, I've never owned a pet. And while I admired and sort of stood in awe of nature um, my whole life, I also thought of it as something that was sort of elsewhere. Um, that I was living in the modern world, surrounded by concrete and skyscrapers, and protected from the forces of nature by modern life. And in that way, I think I was actually suffering from um, the same delusions that many of those around me were about climate change, which I understood at the time to be a real problem, but one that was um, distant in time, distant in place, and likely only a kind of a moderate threat to the way that I and my loved ones lived. The more I started reading about climate and the near future a few years ago, um, the more I realized just how deluded I was, just how complacent I was on each of those points. And I often like to talk about each of them in turn, just to give it a sense of the scope of where I started on my journey, um, which is to say, you know, first about the speed of change. I had understood, I had been raised to believe that climate change was a problem unfolding 
um, on a timeline of centuries, which meant that we had quite a lot of time to take control of, of, the, of the problem and um, figure out solutions and ways to protect ourselves against its assaults. But half of all of the emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity from the burning of fossil fuels have come in just the last 30 years. Um, that's since the, IP, the UN established its IPCC body, which signaling to the world that this was a problem, which means we have done more damage with full understanding of the issue than we ever managed in ignorance. And that is quite disconcerting um, given where we are today. The second big delusion I had was about scope. I had heard about sea level rise. I had heard about Arctic melt. I even understood to some degree that there were some species like polar bears that might be um, at risk from these, from these changes. But I didn't understand just how all encompassing the problem of climate change is and will be even more so in the future, which is to say, I didn't understand the economic impacts, which scientists say might ultimately um, reduce global GDP by 20 or 30% compared to what it would be without climate change and impacts much more intense in parts of the world, like India around the equator, vulnerable to, to drought and heat wave. Um, I didn't understand the effects on agriculture in which just temperature can reduce agricultural yields in theory by as much as 50% this century. And then you have to add on top of that, um, the effect of insects and um, uh, weeds and the reduced agricultural labor that comes from um, intense heat. I didn't understand the effect on river flooding, which is to say this is not just a matter of sea level rise. Um, it can cause huge problems inland. And in fact, we can expect um, even at just a little bit more warming, something like the kinds of floods we used to see once a century um, hitting every single year. And the migration patterns, which are likely to, even if they are largely contained within single nations, totally reorder the culture of those nations and pose a meaningful challenge to the international order that we have today um, that is so built on the inviolability of individual nation states. So climate change is not one challenge, it is gov a governing challenge which touches on every aspect of modern life and will shape the shape of our collective future here. Um, the third big delusion I had was about the severity, just how bad this could get. You know, I, I understood from scientists' warnings about how, we, how quickly we had to move that um, two degrees of warming, which is about double where we are today, was understood as a catastrophic level and that we really should aim to keep warming to something close to 1.5 degrees of warming, where we're already approaching today, depending on where you count, we're 1.3, maybe even 1.4 degrees. Um, I didn't understand that there were worse outcomes than that. And um, the more that I learned about those outcomes, even as unlikely as they may be, the more they scared me. You know, we could see a doubling of war. We could see, um, you know, refugee crises in, in the billions, not just in the hundreds of millions. We could see parts of the planet hit by six climate driven natural disasters at once. This is really, really a quite dramatically different world um, that, we're, that we're headed for if we don't change course. And that put in me quite a lot of fear. Um, now, you know, I'm 38 years old, which means my life essentially contains that entire story. When I was born, scientists understood the challenge, but the planet itself was relatively stable. And now here we are 38 years later, we're, we're somewhat on the brink of catastrophe today. And what will happen over the next 30 years, which is to say within my lifetime, will ultimately shape the human future on the planet for centuries or even millennia forward. And that is, I think, a kind of a hinge point for me, which is to say, what we are looking at is quite terrifying. But the fact that it is terrifying, the scale of that fear, the scale of those impacts are ultimately a sign of the power that we retain over the planet's climate. If we get to some of these really scary scenarios, some of these really scary futures, it will be because of choices we make today and actions we take today or fail to take today. This is a drama unlike anything humans have ever lived with before. Within the space of a single lifetime, my lifetime and your lifetime, we will have engineered a crisis for ourselves and we have the opportunity to engineer our way out of it. Our hands are on those levers and we can write a different story if we choose, not just as observers, but as protagonists.
I often say this is not the kind of story that we're even comfortable recognizing in the modern world because it places us in a position and in a story that we used to only recognize in mythology and theology. We are essentially playing the role of gods here and we have to accept that responsibility if we have a hope of securing a comfortable, livable, prosperous, rewarding and just future um, for everyone on the planet today and everyone in successive generations. Now, of course, when I use that language, not just the theological language, but the language of we and our, this it covers a huge set of disparities um, for responsibility for the climate crisis and for um, the burdens that will be imposed by climate changes. Um, you know, certain countries of the world, and India may be, in fact, the, the best example, are scheduled to suffer quite intensely in the decades ahead, despite having done very little to this point to cause the problem. The countries of the world that have done the most to cause the problem are unfortunately those like the US and, and Britain to a lesser extent China, um, although that will their responsibility will grow in the decades ahead. These are countries that are not going to be hit nearly as intensely. And so when we talk about responsibility and we talk about um, leadership, we have to keep both of those facts in mind that those who have engineered this crisis are not those who are going to be suffering most and those who are suffering most are those who are least responsible. That is a horrifying moral indictment, um, but it should also guide our thinking and our action going forward. On some level, it can be discouraging because you see those facts, you think about them and you think, well, those people who are doing the damage, why would they, why would they change course? But for me, the story of the last few years is an incredibly inspiring one um, that suggests the opposite story, which is so many people all around the world over the last few years have really woken up and understood that this is a universal challenge, that it threatens all of us, even if it threatens us unequally. And that for many of us, bearing more responsibility is a reason for taking more action rather than less. Now I've finished my book, finished writing the manuscript of my book in um, October of 2018, which is not all that long ago, ultimately. But at that point, nobody in the world had even heard of Greta Thunberg. She had just begun striking outside of Swedish parliament. The UN had not yet issued its sort of landmark 1.5 degree report, which really was the one that spurred this great awakening by telling us that we had about 10 years, 20 by 2030, to cut emissions by roughly half. Um, we hadn't seen the huge wave of pledges by nations made independently, not even in international um, setting in which they were applying peer pressure to one another to decarbonize quite rapidly. We've seen just over the last year during the pandemic, we've seen such pledges from Japan and South Korea, many of the nations of the EU and the EU entirely, China maybe most significantly, and Joe Biden in the US, which means now something like two thirds of global emissions are committed to a rapid path of decarbonization. Um, that was unthinkable just a few years ago. And maybe most inspiring of all is the political awakening of the world's youth. And I say that for this reason, I'm a relatively young person, I'm relatively privileged to have some um, relationship to political power in a very powerful country in the world. And yet I looked at the climate crisis a few years ago and I found it intimidatingly large and challenging. And I thought, what could one person possibly do? Now the, the, the global, leaders of the climate youth movement, climate strikers in particular, faced all those same obstacles, saw the same challenges, and even faced more of them. Most of them were underage, couldn't vote in their countries. Many of them were in places where voting wasn't even possible. Many of them came from marginalized communities, from uh, you know, our, our, our queer youth um, disempowered in that way. And so to the extent that someone like me looked at the challenge and found it intimidating, these were people who had faced many, many more obstacles to change. And yet they didn't, see that challenge and see that problem and withdraw. They took the opposite message and said, we need to fight to make a place for ourselves and in, indeed our entire generation at the table of power. And miraculously, really miraculously, in the space of just a year or two, they did, complete, you did, completely changing the conversation about climate change the world over, such that now it is no longer possible for nearly any leader to plausibly deny the reality of climate change or even the urgency of action. And I say that not just about our 
political leaders. I say that about even our corporate leaders who for a very long time were quite invested in a strategy of delay and denial. Now that doesn't mean that the battle has been won or the future will inevitably proceed in a prosperous and just way at all. It means that all of us who have made this difference, which is to say many of you, you know, in this, in, in this event who I'm speaking to and who I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to more directly in the second half of, of this session, it is on all of our shoulders, it is all of our responsibility to do two really big things. The first is to continue fighting to make sure that the pledges that have been made are made real by our leaders. When our country says we need to decarbonize, we need to make that happen. We can't just allow a sort of rhetoric of climate action and climate awareness cover a continued strategy of delay. We do not have the time for that. And the second big thing is to make sure that the global disparities when it comes to climate change are addressed by those in power, which is to say the richest and most powerful countries in the world. This can take many forms, but it begins with an understanding that the countries of the world that are today rich owe that wealth to fossil fuel pollution, which is damaging the prosperity and health of those living in the developing world. It means that presumably those countries owe a responsibility to support the decarbonization programs in those other parts of the world who have not yet made or not yet as close to the threshold of true um, clean energy as a country like Norway might be or the United States even might be. But I think it also means in a way that's very um, just as urgent, even though we talk about it a lot less, that we need to force the, the rich nations of the world and the rich people of the world to support adaptation measures to protect people who are vulnerable, living especially around the equatorial band of the planet in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, most notably. Um, so that the impacts that are already inevitable, which is to say those that we're likely to see at 1.5 and 1.7 and two degrees of warming, are not as overwhelming and indeed lethal as they seem to be today because we have engineered solutions to protect those people from those impacts. Cooling centers, new forms of crops that can grow um, under different kinds of conditions. In some cases, seawalls and other forms of flood protection, um, even just early warning systems for typhoons and, and monsoons as we've seen have benefited the people of Bangladesh um, dramatically in contrast to those right next door um, in Myanmar, which who are facing the same the same impacts. We need to understand the responsibility, the global responsibility to those suffering and those scheduled to suffer in these parts of the world and not turn our back on them, which means that those of us living in those parts of the world have a responsibility to raise their voices, make their plight known and make it known globally that their own lives, their own difficulties cannot be ignored by those in power with the resources and the moral responsibility to help. Um, so with that, I think, um, I think we can turn to some, some Q and A and questions. I'm really looking forward to speaking with all of you. I hope that was, that offered some amount of hope in addition to um, a sort of bleak statement of, of where we are, because I, I do think just to return to the way, the way that I opened before we, we turn to questions, you know, these questions of hope and optimism are always a matter of perspective. And I think it is, we need to be realistic about where we are, what progress is possible and what inevitable impacts we will be facing rather than continuing to hope that we can engineer our way entirely or revolutionize our way entirely away from the problem of climate change. For that is, we are already too late for that. That doesn't mean that the impacts need to overwhelm us. It doesn't need, mean that we need to um, allow a truly uninhabitable earth or even uninhabitable parts of the planet to arise. But it means that we have to understand that we are working off a baseline of climate change. We are already in a transformed planet and we need to be responding in all ways at all times to the challenges that that faces, both decarbonizing and adapting so that a generation from now, our children can look back and indeed we can look back at our, at our own lives and see that we did everything we could to sort of secure um, what looks like a, a relatively prosperous, relatively habitable and relatively just future.
Wonderful, David. So, uh, you are one of very few, you know, uh, we speak with who is speaking in terms of the present tense, that this is what we mean now. Uh, in general, people are, when we talk about climate change, people more in sense of, in terms of, like, in, if we take one example of the sea rise, Arctic ice melt, the sea level will rise and there will be cities who would be submerged. Put more light onto that. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's my internet connection or yours, but I, I, th I think you cut off there. I couldn't hear the end of, end of your question. Um, my question is, people, those who are talking about climate change, more in terms of future tense, mainly in terms of sea level rise. Can you talk more on that? Well, um, you know, ultimately, sea level rise is going to be an enormous problem. I think that we're likely to um, get to about two degrees or maybe a little north of two degrees of warming. Um, I think that's roughly speaking a best case scenario. I think technically we could aim to keep things at maybe 1.8 or 1.9, but I think that the challenges of that are, are so enormous. I think something like two degrees is a good anchor for our expectations and just north of two degrees. Um, we, we would expect um, some irreversible changes in the planet's um, ice sheets and glaciers. And all told, those are likely to um, bring over time as much as 80 meters of sea level rise, um, many, 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 many more times than, we're, than we've been taught to expect um, because we often talk about climate impacts only this century and the depletion of, those, um, of, of that ice will unfold over indeed over millennia. Now that means that we will have a chance to adapt to it. And those, those cities that we could say today will be quote unquote underwater with 80 meters of sea level rise, which is basically two thirds of the world's major cities. Um, we will have centuries to, you know, to, to build defenses or to move. Um, it's not as though we're gonna wake up one morning and be entirely underwater. But the way that that changes the landscape of the world, flooding in a much more quotidian way, um, not just along the coast, but all through the rivers is really quite dramatic. I mentioned earlier that just at, at two degrees of warming, we'd expect that flooding events that used to be um, arriving just once every hundred years, would, we would expect to hit once a year. Um, and we're likely to see two degrees, um, you know, probably within the next uh, 30 years, depending on, on, the, on the course that we take, the path that we take. Um, this is really, really quite dramatic. And I think it illustrates you know, that we were asking about long-term impacts and, and, and near-term impacts. And I think, um, you know, the truth is that we have to understand that these are, this is a continuum. Um, the things that we are seeing today are going to get worse over time. Um, in some cases, they will be categorically worse. And in some cases, they will just be um, sort of gradually worse. Um, but we are all, we already somewhat have our hands full with the impacts um, that we have today at just depending on how you count, maybe 1.2, 1.3 degrees of warming. And when I think about that, I think it's really important to understand that um, while 1.3 degrees doesn't sound like very much, it already puts us entirely outside the window of temperatures that enclose all of human history. The entire history of human civilization has been conducted um, with a, within a very narrow band of temperatures that we have already exited. It's like we've landed on a totally new planet and we've got to figure out what are the civilization that we have brought with us can survive these new conditions and what will have to be remodeled and renovated. That's at just 1.3 degrees. So two degrees gets considerably worse, three degrees even worse, four degrees if we get there, much, much worse than that. Um, now I think it's, you know, when we think about the long-term impacts, there's also long-term adaptation that we can do. I mentioned protections to cities, but there are many other forms. Um, and especially when, when we're trying to cultivate our, our hopeful uh, reflexes. I think it's critical to understand that climate impacts really are just half of the story. And what we do is the other half. We, if we're at three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, climate change is going to overwhelm the way that humans live. But that doesn't mean that it's going to annihilate us. It just means that it will be the dominant story of human life at that time. We will still be able to, you know, um, 
raise children and, and have families and, and make works of art and all the things that humans have always done. It will just be an existence that is defined by the impacts of climate change much more um, than we understand today. Although if we looked really closely at the world today, I think we would see the fingerprints of climate change uh, in far more places than, than most of us um, tend, to, tend to admit. Uh, David, hi, this is Rakesh here. So, uh, you know, when you say uh, what we do makes a lot of difference, right? Um, I mean, mass production and increased consumerism is one of the major problems that, uh, you know, the world is facing right now. And that is what's causing global warming. Uh, especially in India, we are starting to see a lot more uh, consumerism that's happening. Uh, so what do you think uh, we can do as individuals to fight it? Well, I think the most important path is political. Um, I think that it's important to make changes in your own life if you would like to, um, so that you feel empowered by your own values rather than um, like you're living like a hypocrite. Um, although personally, I think that hypocrisy often gets a little bit of a bad name because really what it describes is the dynamic by which we are hoping to be better together than we are as individuals, which is I think a very important impulse to cultivate. Um, and I think it's important to you know, it, it can be helpful to make changes in your own life to signal to those around you that you are worried about this and to, um, to make real um, your own climate concerns so that those who love you and those who know you um, will start to reflect on the same issues themselves. But ultimately the changes that we're hoping to make are beyond the scope of individual agents taking action in their own lives. Um, you know, I can't rebuild the electricity grid um, I can't build a solar farm. Um, I can't, you know, build new high-speed rail that allows me to travel um, carbon-free rather than driving in a car that's gasoline-powered. Um, I can't, you know, I can't build new infrastructure through my city. Um, I can't, you know, institute housing policy that requires zero-carbon construction materials. These are all changes that, by definition, must be undertaken at the political level, um, if not the geopolitical level. And that means that I think the most important thing that any individual can do is to raise political awareness and put pressure on their leaders, both local and national, um, to take the issue quite seriously. And, you know, in what I, one thing I would emphasize in particular um, for, for Indians, um, most of all, is that there is, you know, the problem of air pollution is so, um, so dramatic. In certain ways, even globally, it, it may even be a bigger challenge imposing a higher cost on human flourishing than climate change itself. You know, the global estimates are that 10 million people die every year because of air pollution, most of that because of the burning of fossil fuels, although there's also, also agricultural burning and um, indoor pollution from, from cooking. Um, India is the country in the world that is facing that challenge most intensely. Um, you know, the average resident of Delhi, it's been calculated, loses nine years of life to air pollution. Um, you know, across the whole northeast band of, of the country, um, you, can, you can't even really find a single county where the average life lost is less than five years. Um, you have in the nation as a whole, 350,000 stillbirths and miscarriages every year from the effects of air pollution. Um, and to some degree, this is a challenge that is a, a more manageable one, a more immediate one than the global warming challenge, in part because um, the costs are local, which means that the political calculus is very clear. If, if you clean up your air, then local people will flourish. Um, health costs will go dramatically down and global uh, the, the, not global, the economic impacts, the local economic impacts will be very vivid. So that calculus is very, very clear. It also happens in the short term because the replacing of especially coal-fired um, power plants, but also um, internal combustion engines generally, which is possible over a 10 or 20 year timeline, even for a country like India, um, will have unbelievably dramatic impacts on the, the well-being of, of the nation. So you know, when we think about global warming, it can be quite intimidating because it is global and the benefits of decarbonization are distributed, but the benefits of cleaner air are local and they are immediate. And to me, that is that makes an argument for fast action. It's a very useful organizing principle for Indians in particular. Um, and I think can, can even form the basis 
of not just national, but global action on climate change because the costs of inaction when it comes to pollution are so intense and so and the, and the benefits of action are so clear that almost anyone staring directly at them would have no choice but to conclude we must move with rapid, rapid urgency. Yes, I think, David, thank you so much. Yeah, this is uh, what you said is very right. And it's quite alarming. I agree with you that the, the challenges we are facing. And by the way, I stay in Delhi. So, you know, I'm very scared. <laughs> so, David, uh, coming back, uh, a, a lot of questions we have curated for you, which we are trying to ask is the ones which we got from the audience when they came to know that you're coming over for a talk. So one thing which is really in the minds of a lot of people is, that uh, the, there's a huge number which is being thrown around every day on everyone. That's 52 billion. Somebody said it's 60 billion tons of CO2 equivalent is being put out there in the atmosphere every year. So now everybody is wondering that will we be able to get this number down substantially? Because last year we saw in COVID when 2020 COVID happened and the world economy, there was hardly any difference in emissions. And so how do we manage literally 55 to 60 billion ton equivalent of uh, emissions, which is there up there? So people want, would like to know, do you think there is a, is it practical in, a, in our lifetime that things will happen? Will, it, will we be able to get this carbon dioxide levels down to a manageable level the way things are? Well, I think you have to start by asking what is a manageable level? And unfortunately, when it comes to climate, the answer is, zero, we have to get all the way to zero because um, any amount of additional carbon that we're adding to the atmosphere on an annual basis is going to continue warming the planet further. So yeah, you mentioned you know ballpark 60 billion tons of carbon equivalent every year. Um, even if we get that down to five, which would be an unbelievably dramatic reduction, that those five tons a year would still be adding more to the atmosphere. Now there are some things we can do with taking carbon out of the atmosphere if, you know, um, at, the, at the scale of say five tons, we might be able to manage that amount and, and make it effectively a net zero um, system. But in general, I think it's very important to understand that big picture, we have to get to zero if we have a hope of stopping warming. And that's a really, as you say, a really, really, really big task. Um, you know, much of the pie chart of emissions is tied up in um, a few sectors that I think are relatively easy to decarbonize, which is to say power, electricity, and most transportation. We basically have those tools today in the form of wind power, solar power, um, electrification, and you know, especially of, of the automobile sector. Um, now, that transition will be expensive, um, you know, replacing our coal power plants with wind farms and solar plants will be expensive. It will require a lot of land. We will have to build new electric grids that manage that, um, that power more effectively. But we have the technology today. And in fact, um, most economists looking at the issue see that the benefits of making those investments come back to us quite quickly in the time span of just, you know, say a decade, um, which for infrastructure projects or initiatives of that kind is a quite fast turnaround. So the logic is quite clear. The economic logic is quite clear. We have, because um, these technologies have fallen so dramatically in price over the last decade or so, it now makes very clear, even in arguable economic sense, not to mention environmental sense for us to make these transitions in the power, um, electricity and transportation sectors. But that leaves a fair amount of other sectors which are a little more complicated. Um, in particular, heavy industry, which is um, harder, infrastructure, which is a bit more challenging, and agriculture, which is really has to do with land use um, more than the actual farming. It's like turning what used to be forests into farms is quite damaging. Um, those are a little bit more challenging, and I think are probably that we're probably going to engineer solutions on a longer time scale. But I do think it's plausible that over the next decade or two, we could make globally an enormous amount of progress on those three dominant sectors. And I would say, looking at the experience of the last year, it's possible to take a more hopeful message than, than you do, which is, you know, emissions did fall. They fell globally about 7%, which is actually roughly in line with what the UN says we need to do to get to roughly a 50% emissions reduction by 2030. Now, we don't wanna do that like we did over the last year through yeah. 
disaster and calamity, um, but it also shows that a reduction is, is conceivable. And much of the response to the pandemic, I think, you know, you can read what happened in a variety of different ways, but one way of reading it is to say that in essentially the entire globe reordered their lives very dramatically in the space of just a few months in response to a threat that they didn't even know existed a few months before. Now that came at an enormous cost, but it does show that we were willing to really reorder almost every aspect of our lives in almost every corner of the globe from the poorest countries to the richest countries. And, you know, the pandemic is a different kind of a threat than climate change because it arrives quickly. It threatens very directly. It threatened our sense of individual health. But when you think about what was engineered in response, especially last spring, um, it is kind of inspiring and um, exhilarating to know how much change was possible, especially for someone like me, who had looked at the climate fight over the past few decades and seen so little willingness to make dramatic change. The pandemic showed us we were willing, um, especially out of concern for ourselves and those around us, which is exactly the challenge that the climate poses. Now, in the bigger picture, we also know that engineering the, a transition for, to a green economy um, is affordable uh, given, you know, compared to the amount of money that's been spent on pandemic relief. Um, yes. Some studies have estimated that we'd only have to spend globally about 10% of what was spent on pandemic relief over the next five years. So in total, about 50% of what was spent on pandemic relief in order to usher in this transition. That is to me quite, um, encouraging. It means that we don't even have to suffer, or suffer is the wrong word, we don't even have to spend as much as we spent over the last year um, in order to bring about the world that we all want. And since we did what we did over the last year, it means we can do what we need to do over the next few years. Um, I think the, the, the returns on, on that proposition are at the moment not so encouraging. We're not spending nearly as much of the pandemic relief money that is being spent on, on climate issues, but it is conceivable. And um, I think for that reason, I'm more encouraged coming out of the pandemic than I was heading in about what could be done um, to draw down carbon quickly. But I think we also have to keep in mind that, you know, the world is going to continue warming um, because the challenge is so intense and large. In addition to the challenge of decarbonization, we are also gonna have to be dealing with questions of adaptation. Um, which may prove, especially in a country like India, um, a, a more a bigger challenge than, than the decarbonization one. And David, uh, coming uh, same question, like if we take the discussion forward of what you're saying, a life example, the time frame everybody's talking about, like 2030, because definitely if we don't achieve targets by 2030, then 2050 is not coming in any way. So. 2050 is one. So uh, can you a little bit elaborate more on your timeline? What, what do you think, like by 2030, do you really think it is realistically possible what the targets we are seeing at present? Or do you think there would be a different time frame we might actually get when we start working on it? Like, because currently the thought process is that by 2030, you go up to 45% or 50% of your emission reduction. And then by 2050, it should be net zero. That's what everybody wants to talk about, uh, or maximum 60. What do you think? Is this time frame realistic? Or is it, we are just guessing it again? <laughs> My own view, I'm a bit of a pessimist about some of this stuff. So the timelines that you're mentioning, basically roughly cutting in half by 2030 and getting to net zero by 2050, that's the best understanding that scientists have of what it would take, um, they say, to keep us in range of 1.5 degrees, stay well below two degrees Celsius of warming and keep us close to 1.5 degrees. Um, I don't think that that's possible, um, but a two degree target requires us only to get to net zero by somewhere like 2075 or 2080. And to me, that does seem quite doable. Now, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees is dramatic when it comes to climate impacts. In fact, the report that outlined those gaps that came out in 2018 is what instigated this great global awakening. So that's how horrifying those differences are. Um, I mentioned some of them before, but it would mean probably 150 million additional people dying of air pollution, um, 150 million people. Um, it would mean many cities across South Asia and the Middle East, many of them in India, would be so hot during summer that many people going outside would be risking heat stroke and possibly death, especially if they were trying to work outside. Um, that's quite horrifying. 
It would mean um, human migration patterns growing into the hundreds of millions. So we're talking about really large scale changes to the way that we live on the planet, especially in a country like India. And, but, you know, it's still considerably better than three degrees or four degrees or five degrees. And I do think that something like that two degree timeline is plausible, maybe even a little bit better than that. Um, we may be able to keep it 1.8, 1.9. That's like absolute best case scenario. Um, so my own view is, you know, I'm glad that the world is talking about cutting emissions in half by 2030 because we need to be as ambitious as possible. Um, we need to move as quickly as we can. We need to invest as much as we can. Um, and I think anything that raises our ambitions um, is a force for good. But I think, you know, planning realistically for what life will be like in 2050 or 2060, I think something like um, two degrees is a, is a much more realistic um, target than 1.5 degrees. And um, we need to keep that in mind as well, especially as we're for instance, initiating infra large scale infrastructure projects that will allow us to protect ourselves from climate impacts. Some of those take decades to complete, um, which means we're probably better off planning for a two degree world than a 1.5 degree world. And that, that timeline is, you know, in the US, which, you know, is a country with many more resources um, to devote to this kind of thing, we still are making these problems mistakes all the time. The levees that we built to protect New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina are already sort of out of date 10 years later because we're not um, planning far enough ahead. Um, and, you know, I think I think it's it will pay for us to um, globally to be thinking about, say, two degrees or maybe even a little north of two degrees as what we need to aim for. Now, saying keeping all that in mind, there's also an enormous scientific uncertainty about what these particular emissions paths will mean. Um, you know, when I say staying at two degrees requires us to get to net zero at 2075 or 2080, that's a median projection for a particular emissions path. The climate could prove somewhat more sensitive than that, which would make give us more warming. It could also theoretically prove a little less sensitive than that and give us a little, a little buffer. Um, it's hard to know because a lot of these systems are quite complicated and the best um, analogs that we have from the paleoclimate record are also from times in the planet's history when the world looked very different. And so the feedback mechanisms were different. Um, the last time the planet was, had as much carbon in the atmosphere as it does today, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're at about 1.3 degrees of warming. The last time we had this much carbon, we were at about three degrees of warming. Um, now there are reasons to think we're not, that's not baked in already, um, but there's also some reason to be concerned that, you know, what we call a two degree target may prove to be in fact a two and a half or three degree target. Um, so, which is all the more reason for just doing more um, sort of fat tail, long tail um, contingency planning, especially on the adaptation side. Since like uh, uh, we have now one of our youth leaders, Akarshita, and uh, she will be asking you a question. I question from YouTube. Uh, do you think there are enough jobs in developing countries like India for a just transition to carbon neutral economy? Well, I think most, the short answer is very much yes. I think most economic analysis suggests that there will be more jobs um, producing this transition than than are considerably more jobs produced in, in, in generating this transition than um, will be lost in retiring um, the old energy systems that we have. And I think it's, it's one reason why over the last five or 10 years, economists have um, come around much more to um, the necessity and urgency of fast action on climate, because, you know, we're talking about, you know, tenfold, maybe even 20 fold increase of the number of um, people working on these projects. Now that's not to say, on the other side of the transition that those jobs will exactly be there. But the, the, the necessity of, I mean, the scale of the transition is so large the, um, that it requires, you know, almost a kind of a, 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 a wartime mobilization of, um, of labor. And that will be incredibly good in the short term if we, if we move quickly. The more that we worry about the jobs that, if we worry about the jobs that are, will be lost, we're really, you know, missing the forest for the trees um, on net there will be much more jobs and presumably much better paying jobs um, as, we, as we go through this transition than, than there are today. 
So I think that's one, one real encouraging um, positive sort of talking point about uh, the green transition. And that is, that is very much true for countries in the developing world, not just in, um, not just in the first world. It's, um, it's, the logic is the same. So that means uh, yeah, in our country can start minds into new and sell more innovations. Uh, Akarshita, if you can ask David what you want to ask. Yeah, for sure, Shweta. Hello, David. Uh, it's like I'm, uh, I'm just really excited to ask this question from you because uh, it's like not from me only, it's from everybody. So this is Akarshita, a youth leader from Roots and Shoots. So actually the thing is that climate change is most pressing challenge we are facing. And as educated individuals, we are aware and connected to our surrounding and we understand that. But in this world where the education rate is uh, minimal and somewhere people understand what CO2 is, but somewhere there are people who do not understand. So how, and that how uh, its increase is causing is a cause of concern and how their action impact this planet as whole. So my question is that how can we make such individuals part of our fight against global warming? How we can encourage more and more people to join us? So we all, all our youth wants your words on this. Well, I think for me, um, the most the, the, the most powerful rhetorical tool that you have at your disposal is the one I was discussing earlier about air pollution, because that is something that um, almost everyone around you will understand and recognize. Um, and especially, you know, if you talk to them about the particular health impacts, um, it is quite harrowing and quite personal. So carbon emissions can seem distant. It can seem even like a global problem. Um, but when the air you breathe is full of pollution, you can feel it in your lungs. And um, especially when you understand the sort of the way that that um, breathing in that pollution affects um, public health, it is quite, it, you know, it makes a quite powerful argument for, for fast action, even for people who don't want to engage with or don't totally understand the dynamics of global warming. Um, so for me, that's, that's the strongest, you know, tool in the toolbox that you have. But I think the other thing I would mention is um, the, the point we were just discussing a minute ago, which is the incredible economic opportunities of the green transition. This is, you know, will be a enormous public investment project, which along with all the benefits that will come in terms of cleaner air and lower emissions also just means a huge jobs program. Um, and you know, we are around the world um, suffering from lack of public investment over recent decades. Um, and this is an opportunity to really rebalance that problem and make sure that, um, you know, that our local governments, our national governments are investing directly in the well being of our people. And I think that Action on Climate um, offers those, to me, those very, very two clear benefits. The first is, the health benefits of cleaning up our air. And the second is the economic benefits of an enormous jobs program, which will help, um, you know, help elevate the country's um, level of prosperity. And I think it's, it's really important to understand that this is a, a real watershed change that's happened over the last few years. Um, economists used to worry about the cost of uh, taking action on climate change. They used to worry that it would be a burden on countries, especially developing countries. Um, they no longer think that, almost none of them think that. Almost all of them believe that everyone will be better off by acting more quickly. And that means all nations, it also means people within nations. So for both of those reasons, I think um, there's very, very clear logic which you can use in discussing and talking about climate change um, to those around you. Beyond all that, um, you know, there is the teaching tool of extreme weather, which is unmistakable. Um, you know, the flooding, droughts, famines, um, water shortages, uh, the typhoons and monsoons, you know, all of these things are vivid examples of the changing climate, which anyone who has their eyes open, whether or not they're really educated, can see is different than used to be the case 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and globally, I think that's been a very useful teaching tool 
um, that anyone who, who has their eyes open is seeing that the planet is changing. It used, didn't used to be the case. Those impacts didn't used to be so visible. Unfortunately, we've let things get so out of control that we can see them now with our naked eye. Um, but to the extent that you're worrying about um, mobilizing more support and bringing more people to the cause, I think it's in a perverse way useful that the planet is already suffering as much as it, as it is. Um, so David, uh, climate change uh, hardly makes it to uh, page one of any newspaper in India, actually. <laughs> I mean, we do uh, talk a lot about floods or any natural calamities, but uh, it doesn't necessarily make it to the front page where it should be. Uh, other than Amitav Ghosh, uh, who's a famous author, uh, not many really have dwelled into climate change as an issue to write about. Uh, do you have any message for uh, aspiring writers and journalists? We have a lot of young audience who are um, you know, want to be journalists who are uh, right now studying. Do you have any message for them? Well, I would say from my own perspective, this is an incredibly exhilarating story, an exciting story. It's the, it's not just the biggest story of our time. You know, I was saying earlier about it being a theological story. It's sort of the biggest story of all time. The fate of the planet's, spe the, the fate of the human future lies in the hands of people alive today. The planet is changing, which means that the entire theater of human experience is being transformed by these forces. So it's not just a matter of documenting the tragedies of natural disasters. It's also about telling the stories of those whose lives are changed or transformed, either directly by climate impacts or by um, concern about future climate impacts. Um, there are ways in which this is shaping our, our view of culture, our psychology, our emotions, changing our politics and our geopolitics. There's no aspect of human life, contemporary human life, that is untouched by this force. And in the decades ahead, those impacts will be even greater, which means that you almost can't comprehend and understand the current state of the world and its near-term future without centering the experience of climate change. And once you do center the experience of climate change, you see an unbelievably in incredible, dizzying, um, diverse narrative unfolding. Um, this is a story at the scale of modernity or, um, you know, capitalism, probably even bigger than either of those forces. And to turn away from it as a storyteller is, I think, a, a great tragedy in itself because um, telling stories about life, especially in the near future, but even today, without understanding and, and reckoning with the meaning of climate change means you're, you're losing an enormous amount of what's really um, unfolding. And the more that we can talk about the place that climate, the, the role that climate plays in all of these stories, the richer those stories will be, um, the more penetrating they will be, and the more ultimately inspiring, I think they will be um, towards, towards some kind of climate action. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your story and your voice. We still have so many questions coming up, and I feel we have you soon with us on the questions. Uh, I would like to invite Aditya to wrap up this session today and say a word of thanks to everyone. Okay. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you so much. And I think you're really struggling with your audio today. And I would like to apologize to David and all the audience that we're sorry for this because we are connecting from all over the part of the country. So <laughs> these technical challenges these days are bad. Yeah, I know. And so from the Jane Goodall Institute and Climate Reality India, we are really thankful to David for sparing an hour today, right? Also that too in a Saturday morning when we should be sleeping off today. So <laughs> finding out time and talking to us about probably the most pressing issue of our times. So very thankful to you, David. And we are also really thankful to the audience who have uh, been patiently listening to us. And I'm sorry that some of your questions may not have got answered today because the time was very short. And this topic is probably David can take a 24 hour session. So, <laughs> so I think we are, uh, I think probably some other time we can request David, probably he can give us another masterclass in climate change communication in, in the future coming times, because this is one subject which is not going anywhere. It's going to stay very firmly where we are.
And I think India and the South Asia region are no, uh, we are no strangers to what is happening, David. Uh, whether it was uh, continuously, we are getting these cyclones and the storms, which were never there. And the last one we had in Tokte last month, uh, had it just uh, turned by two degrees, it would have hit Mumbai. And that would have been a devastation of a phenomenal kind. So, so we are very familiar with what's happening. And I think uh, uh, all the youth, the young people in India are also very keen to work on solution part of it. And they really want jobs. They want green jobs. They want to come out with solutions. And that's, I think, what we would all like to work upon, focus upon, so that probably we have a, we are able to meet those targets, which we talk, keep talking about. So that's what we are all looking forward to. And that's all we are trying to do. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, some of the team members uh, who had made this possible. And from myself and Shweta's side, we'd like, really like to thank uh, Mary Louise and Lucy Sosa from Jane Goodall International for helping us with the media. And Samir and Soumya from the Lemon Yellow for giving us the, helping us design some creatives. And the youth leaders from Roots and Shoots, Akashita, Ariaki, Sonu, Jason, Rian, Povi for helping us building up the program. And a very special thanks to Rakesh, who's with us sitting on the panel today. Thank you, Rakesh. Rakesh is also a journalist, David, and he's, uh, he's an ex-climate reality, and he's now working on a Suno India, very popular, and it's, he's focusing on climate change, some wonderful things, you must have a lis uh, listen to this, he's done some wonderful work on Suno India, about some podcasts which are very relevant to Indian audience. And lastly, I would like to thank my great, absolutely fantastic team of climate reality, uh, Bhavesh, Sheetal, and Geetika, who made this possible happen, they've been working on it for last one week, really, and Thanks to them, I think we've been able to do it today, glitch free, accepting a little bit of audio somewhere here or there. So thank you very much, David. Have a good cup of coffee and thank you for being with us. Bye. Thank you so much. Great to talk and uh, hope we all cross paths again soon. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you.